Matt, uh, tell us, tell us about the situation for you when this uh, this uh, magnitude 8.9 hit. Well, it was absolutely unlike anything I've ever experienced before. I've been living here for eight years now, and this was quite simply the biggest, uh, longest-lasting earthquake I've ever experienced here. And that's it, because uh, Kyung La, our reporter there, was saying that she thought it was four to five minutes. Was that was that your your sense as well? Oh. It, Yes, the ground was rolling for an extended period of time. I wasn't exactly sure what to do or where to go. I'd never been prepared for anything like this. My wife and I stood outside and basically held on to the outside of our house. You couldn't even stand up. I mean, literally at the peak of these uh, waves that were washing over the ground, you literally could not stay on your feet. You had to kind of crouch down in a ball or put your back against something so you didn't fall. And that's exactly what we did for the length of the duration of it, which I would say was about probably a minute to two minutes. It felt like a lot longer than that, let me tell you. And, indeed. And are you saying that you live there or that, you, that you're, you're actually traveling there? To talk about? Uh, I actually live here. I've lived here for the last eight years, and I live on the west side of the city in a little uh, section of Tokyo called Kichijoji. And, uh, yes, this, there are earthquakes from time to time, but we have never, ever felt anything on the magnitude, the literal magnitude of what we experienced today. And, and, and that's, that's exactly the story we hear. Now, Matt, as we are talking, we are looking at this extraordinary wave, another tsunami wave moving toward uh, the Japanese coast. This is the moment Japan's nuclear disaster began. A giant tsunami wave crashes into the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, seriously damaging the building's reactors. On Sunday, radioactive water will be discharged into the sea. Meanwhile, workers are investigating a possible leak from reactor number three. And while Japan seeks to prevent future disasters, international concern is growing over the handling of the current nuclear crisis. <laughs> Let's review the accident. The first hydrogen explosion occurred at the building housing reactor number one. It happened after the meltdown, which took place about 10 hours after the earthquake. In this program, we'll look at reactors two and three. The temperatures in these reactors were under control for a while after the tsunami. There was sufficient time to take action, and the staff should have known what they needed to do. So why couldn't they prevent the meltdowns and the release of huge amounts of radioactive substances? To find the answer, we met often with TEPCO workers, who tackled the crisis at the site. We discovered that both the utility and government authorities continue to ignore a crucial problem related to nuclear safety. Our investigation revealed an unexpected fact that made the aftermath of the accident worse. It turns out a safety mechanism might have had the tendency to become harder to operate as the crisis worsened. Furthermore, not just the tsunami, but also the earthquake may have had a critical impact, though TEPCO has denied it. Given the scale of the earthquake, it's possible some devices were not sufficiently quake-proof. We cannot deny the possibility that they suffered damage and caused leaks. As you've seen, pipes that were not built to withstand severe quakes might have cracked, leading to the breakdown of key safety equipment. The Diet Investigation Commission has pointed out that the earthquake may have played a role. In addition to the malfunctioning SR valves we showed earlier, problems related to the most basic issues of nuclear safety remain unexamined. Next we look at reactor number three, which faced a crisis before reactor number two. Operators failed to prevent a meltdown here, too, even though time was on their side. In the background was an issue that went beyond the grounds of the plant. After the accident, reactor number one, reactor number three experienced a core meltdown and hydrogen explosion. Operators had the time and the know-how to prevent the crisis, but failed to do so. Why? 
As it turned out, there was a hidden pitfall. This was reactor number three's main control room 32 hours before the hydrogen explosion. Operators were continuing efforts to cool down the reactor with the few batteries that had survived the tsunami. A day and a half had already passed since the tsunami plowed through the plant. It was just a matter of time before they would run out of batteries. At the onset of the crisis, TEPCO had arranged for batteries to be delivered to the Fukushima Daiichi plant. The self-defense forces delivered two-volt batteries which are often used at power plants. But operators needed 12-volt batteries to open the SR valves. The batteries are highly portable and weigh as little as 10 kilograms. Ten of them provide enough power to open an SR valve. At the quake-proof building, workers were procuring emergency supplies. SRV に必要なバッテリーは120V。SRV が要らなければ現状の2水は入らない。同心損傷が始まる。今あるバッテリーを2V から。12V は届いていません。次回用紙からバッテリーを集めるしかない。手の空いてる人は自分の車からバッ
The operators were driven into a corner. TEPCO had procured 12 volt batteries. But as of the night of March 13th, they remained at a stock base 55 kilometers from the crippled plant. There were more than 1,000 of them. These are photos of supplies at the base. Small pumps and generators were also stranded there. No mechanism existed to transport goods to the contaminated plant. The workers at the plant felt that, without the proper support, Preventing a meltdown was impossible. Things that we needed the most didn't come at all. Really, what would you expect us to do under such circumstances? I know I shouldn't speak like this, but that's how we felt. People may say the explosion could have been avoided if we'd had this or that. Well, I'm afraid there's no end to such hypothetical arguments. Japan lacked a system to deliver necessities to nuclear plants contaminated with radiation. Eventually, workers at reactor number three had to resort to using batteries from their own cars. Six hours had already passed since attempts to cool the reactor failed. But our simulation showed the nuclear fuel had already been damaged, releasing hydrogen into the reactor building. During the Fukushima crisis, three reactors melted down in succession. The radioactive materials they released have contaminated the soil. More than 160,000 residents are still unable to return home. Again, I believe those operators responding to the crisis on the shop floor well, they did their best. Yet, given the consequences presented, I'd say... We failed to meet the challenge. We do not expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, or U.S. territories in the Pacific. Furthermore, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and public health experts do not recommend that people in the United States take precautionary measures.
mistakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. Well, you have been exposing the fact that we have been nuclear guinea pigs since 1945. That's right. And I would like to start with the current status of the Fukushima plant two years into the accident. It's uh, not good for us, that's for sure. At first, when that happened on March 11, 2011, it was a disaster that the world has never imagined was even possible. We were told three partial meltdowns, don't worry about it. Now we know it was 100% core melt in all three reactors. Um, Japan is, by orders of magnitude, many times worse than Chernobyl. Never in my life did I think that six nuclear reactors would be at risk. Well, TEPCO is like the little Dutch boy. All of a sudden, we have cracks in the dike. You put a finger here, you put a finger there, and all of a sudden, new leaks start to occur, and they're overwhelmed, literally making it up as they go along. We're in totally uncharted territories. You get any nuclear engineering book, look at the last chapter, and this scenario is not contained in the last chapter of any nuclear engineering textbook on the planet Earth. So they're making it up as they go along, and we are the guinea pigs for this science experiment that's taking place. All radiation is damaging, it's cumulative, each dose you get adds to your risk of getting cancer. Within days of the Fukushima Daiichi catastrophe beginning, we were getting uh, fallout coming down in rain in the United States. And also, of course, the, uh, the seafood. Um, not only does the ocean's currents bring the radioactivity this way, but also uh, the sea life itself, the bluefin tuna, uh, migrated from Japan to North America and carried the radioactive cesium in its flesh over here. Wow. Not a good time to be eating tuna. The food chain remains contaminated for hundreds or thousands of years, and we'll start seeing lung cancer and leukemia, I think, two to five years from now. And then solid cancers will start appearing um, 15 to 60, 70 years later. So the ace up the sleeve is of the nuclear industry is the incubation time for cancer. It takes a long time for cancers to develop once you have inhaled or been exposed to these radioactive elements. And no cancer identifies its origin. And so there is already a level of cancer in society, but it's going to increase dramatically. The problem is not really under control. It will not be under control for, it's estimated, between 40 and 100 years from now. There's no way to clean it up. They say 40 years, but they can't clean it up. They can't. And the site's still unstable and vulnerable to natural disasters. If there is another earthquake, a serious one, six, seven, eight, or nine magnitude, that would rattle all these 1,060 tanks. It would rattle the, the, the damaged cores, spent fuel, who, whose structures have already weakened. Yes. That's a potential very, very serious threat. Approximately 300 tons of water was filtering through the site until early this month, becoming laced with radioactive materials and then seeping into the sea. Another factor is the ever-increasing amount of water accumulating inside damaged infrastructure. Once it makes its way into reactor buildings, it mixes with radioactive isotopes. For months, TEPCO workers have been pumping up 400 tons of water every day and storing it in tanks on site. Uh, the, there is 1,060 tanks, stainless steel water tanks, that are holding the water which they keep pumping into the, into the uh, damaged reactors and the uh, uh, spent fuel storage pools. From the air, the scale of the problems at Fukushima become clear. The growing mass of storage tanks now dwarfs the plant itself. More than a million tons of highly radioactive water 
is now stored here. But the tanks have been hastily built. They're made of steel plates, bolted together, rather than welded. Last week, workers detected a major leak in one of those tanks. About 300 tons of water escaped, releasing several quadrillion becquerels of radioactive particles. Experts have often pointed out how vulnerable they are to damage. The tanks, though, have been put together very quickly. There's no guarantee they'll last. Their seals are made of rubber and the joints and, and bolts are corroding. And they may last not more than five years. So the tank farm has grown dramatically and it's on the hill. Of course, the problem is because it's on the hill, the um, water flows down. And if there's an earthquake, all of these pipes are held together with plastic piping. Not much different than what you've got on a swimming pool. So the plastic pipe will, will, will um, snap and that water will just run right down that roadway directly into the ocean. So the radiation has been leaking into the water and polluting the fish continuously for the last two years. Plus strontium, plus cesium, plus tritium and I could go on and on and on. If it gets into the sea, the algae concentrated hundreds of times, then the crustaceans concentrated hundreds of times, then the little fish, then the big fish, then us. Because we stand on the apex of the food chain. You can't taste these radioactive elements, you can't see them, and you can't smell them. They're silent. This graphic shows the gradual contamination of the Pacific Ocean due to leaks of radioactive water from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan. The simulation, which was run by a German marine research institute, shows the entire Pacific waters being polluted by radioactive water in just six years. The fuel core of Unit 4 at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. More than 1,500 fuel rods sit in a damaged storage pool 30 meters above ground. Yeah, the, the amount of radioactivity within the, in the rods themselves is about 14,000 times that of the, the Hiroshima bomb. We are dealing with diabolical energy. E equals mc squared. It's the energy that blows up nuclear bombs. Einstein said nuclear power is a hell of a way to boil water. They need to remove those fuel rods from the pool because if there's another earthquake, building four would go down probably and the, all those fuel rods would be exposed to the air and they would burn and they would release ten times more radiation or cesium than was released at Chernobyl. Huge amounts and pollute much of Japan and the northern hemisphere. So we're in a nuclear crisis at the moment. If there's another earthquake and building four collapses which contains the cooling pool with fresh fuel, I'm going to evacuate my family from Boston. So they put a crane on top of that building which is shaky anyway. And they're going to lift the fuel assemblies out one by one with the crane and it will be done manually. Normally those rods are removed by computer control with millimetres to spare. It's a very delicate operation. The fuel rods must be kept submerged and must not touch each other or break. Nuclear experts warn any mishaps could cause an explosion many times worse than that one here in March 2011. Because if several rods touch each other you could reach criticality and the whole fuel pool could go critical or if the rods break as they're being lifted out large amounts of radiation would escape from the rods and the area would have to be evacuated, meaning that the area is evacuated. The continuous operation of cooling five spent fuel pools and three melted cores would stop. <laughs> Need I go on? While this week marks the anniversary of the atomic catastrophes on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, today Japanese attention turns to other nuclear concerns. Tensions in Japan are rising over the radioactive water leaking into the Pacific Ocean from the country's crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, which was devastated by the earthquakes and tsunami of 2011. Joining me now in studio to discuss the radioactive leak is Paul Gunter, director of the Reactor Oversight Project at BeyondNuclear.org. 
Thank you for being here, Paul. We really Thank you very your much. Presence. Now, I'm going to start off by asking you, can you tell us how long the contaminated water has been, how long the contamination has been leaking into the water? Very likely since the uh, explosions and the meltdown at uh, Fukushima Daiichi in March of uh, 2011. Wow, that, that is quite a long time. Now, how much and what sort of radiation is leaking into the Pacific? I know there's all different types, so if you can explain that right. in a little detail. Well, clearly what we've seen now is the movement of radioactive hydrogen, tritium, uh, which uh, is a uh, mobile uh, radioactive isotope, but clearly um, radioactive cesium-134, 137, strontium-90. We're seeing a full range of radioactive contaminants now moving, which indicate that uh, the damaged cores of these reactors, the meltdowns themselves, uh, have, are now contributing to the contamination of the Pacific Ocean and groundwater that's moving at a, about a, a rate of a 300 to 400 gal, uh, uh, metric tons. Uh, per day. So, but these uh, numbers are really um, only approximations and will vary, but clearly a lot of radioactivity is moving through groundwater into the ocean. Now, why is the plan continuing to leak? You'd think they would have, or maybe they already have, taken steps to contaminate some of this leakage. Well, they, um, they have, you know, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, put up a temporary wall between the uh, reactor wreckage and the uh, the ocean but uh, this is really acted no, nothing more than just like a dam so that the water is building up behind the dam and now it's breached the dam it's spilling over and the radioactive contamination is moving into the Pacific but um, it's uh, you know right now we're seeing the, the Japanese government is in chaos uh, this, the fact that the revelation of this extensive contamination is coming now more than two years after the accident occurred uh, indicates that it's completely out of control mm -hmm. and uh, the command and control uh, is in chaos in Japan right now and, and really the big question is why aren't they calling international aid to address the radioactive contamination of the Pacific Ocean? Why do you suspect they aren't calling international aid? The, the problems are, I think, clearly that uh, there's, there's no transparency. And the government and the industry, as documented by the Japanese Diet, their Congress, is that there's been a collusion all along. And uh, so what we're seeing is a veil being drawn over the accident to, to uh, promote an agenda for continue the restart of these reactors in Japan and uh, to try to contain uh, the uh, bad news rather than the radiation. That's very concerning because the radiation is much worse than just the news itself. Now, what can be done beyond these dams that you mentioned before in terms of contaminating the leakage? Well, the, the, you know, in order to contain the leaks, we have to isolate the radioactive waste. But indications are right now that the reactor structures themselves have been breached. Uh, it's very likely that the, um, some of the radioactive material, the melted cores, have moved into the earth. And the, uh, the, so the containing, it's beyond containment right now. I think that's the tragedy uh, that we see unfolding as Fukushima's radioactive water crisis is only beginning. That's very concerning. How far has this radiation spread and how fast is it going while it spreads? Again, some of the radioactive isotopes are more mobile than others. Radioactive tritium, uh -huh. uh, the hydrogen, it moves anywhere water goes because it is radioactive hydrogen and, and makes up a component of water. So um, the, the spread of the contamination is only going to be as effectively monitored as the technology is out there. And frankly, we don't know the full extent. Uh, nobody really knows the full extent of the contamination at this point as it moves through uh, not only groundwater but also through the atmosphere and into ocean currents. So um, it, it's, we're in a very grave situation right now as the, uh, the Japanese government has uh, declared this is a new radiation emergency coming out of a worsening situation at Fukushima Daiichi. Now what does this mean for the people of Japan and around the world? I think that certainly the concern right now is that 
the people of Japan want more transparency mm -hmm. into what their government is or is not doing about this uncontrolled radioactive catastrophe. Uh, the meetings that are going on right now between industry and government are behind closed doors. So the Japanese people are asking for more transparency to, uh, to get a better understanding of just how un out of control this whole situation is. And that's going to be true for New Zealand, for Taiwan, for Korea, for China, uh, for all the, the, uh, the immediate Pacific nations, but ultimately it raises concerns for radio radioactive contamination in the uh, ocean currents in the Pacific. Fears are rising in the U.S. that the popular bluefin tuna caught off the West Coast contains radiation. Western Japan is to blame, but some claim these radioactive findings may only be the tip of the iceberg. Archie's Modina Kochnova reports. This summer, Californian fishermen are ready to inspect their catch closer than ever before. The word radiation creates uh, fear in people. The reason for such concern lies in the latest discovery by scientists that bluefin tuna caught off the Californian coast contain radioactive isotopes brought over from the waters of Japan. The news that migratory fish may now be bringing that radioactivity across the Pacific has sparked a media frenzy in the U.S. This is the first time such a large migrating fish has been shown to carry radioactivity so far. This next item made a lot of U.S. consumers sit up and take notice. They've actually found low levels of radiation in seafood off the coast of California. That raises a lot of alarm bells. But there are fears that radiation in bluefin tuna is only the first sign of much worse disaster to come for the West Coast. Radiation is coming across the Pacific in the ocean currents, contaminating all of the sea life. It's been completely hidden. Uh, it's a covert... Radiation experts believe the real scale of the nuclear disaster will not be known for many decades, as the radiation released during the meltdown is accumulating in the global environment. Later this summer, scientists will repeat their study on migratory fish, but this time on a far greater scale than before, and taking in a number of different species. Experts say this will provide a real test of just how much radiation has been flowing across from Japanese waters to American shores. My dear question of RT reporting from Los Angeles, California. news. The Japanese aren't the only ones who are continuing to suffer from the fallout of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. 
And now it appears that radiation released from the failed Fukushima reactors back in March of 2011, more than two years ago, have affected children born in Hawaii and along the entire west coast of the United States. According to the Radiation and Public Health Project, children born in Alaska, California, Hawaii, Washington State, and Oregon, between one week and 16 weeks after the nuclear meltdown, were 28% more likely to suffer from congenital hypothyroidism than were kids born in those states during the same time a year earlier in 2010. Basically what happened is large quantities of radioactive iodine-131 were blown out of the Fukushima reactors and then traveled across the Pacific Ocean before falling on Hawaii, the West Coast, and other Pacific nations in the form of rain and snow that reached radiation levels hundreds of times greater than those considered safe. And research, research suggests that the fallout from Fukushima will only get worse. So just how bad will the effects of the nuclear fallout get? And what's the latest coming out of Fukushima today? Joining us now is Kevin Camps, nuclear waste watchdog with Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. So Kevin, are you surprised by some of this new information? I mean, were we expecting these sort of fallout effects on the West Coast? Well, we knew in the first days and weeks and months after the Fukushima catastrophe began that we were receiving fallout, radioactive fallout in precipitation. I remember one day in April of 2011 when it was reported by the U.S. federal government that Boise, Idaho had had rainfall that measured 242 times the Safe Drinking Water Act limits for radioactive iodine-131. So we knew that we were getting fallout. Um, in places like Kalamazoo, Michigan, where I'm sitting right now, they got elevated fallout of different isotopes, including cesium. So these are reported by the, uh, the federal government agencies of well, the United if, States. If Kalamazoo, Michigan has it, then the entire world almost has to have it. I mean, Kalamazoo is on the other side of the world. Am I well, right? certainly in terms of atmospheric fallout, the, uh, the prevailing winds uh, carried it throughout the northern hemisphere. And then with the ocean uh, discharges from Fukushima, which are unprecedented, uh, the currents took those all over the place, including the southern hemisphere. So the health impacts should not be a surprise. They're, they're tragic. And so, we've known since the 1950s, actually the U.S. nuclear establishment in its secrecy knew since the 1950s that radioactive iodine will cause thyroid pathology uh, downwind. They were doing secret experiments at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in the 1950s. We found out about it in the 1990s under President Clinton when it was finally revealed. And if anybody had any doubts, the Chernobyl catastrophe that began in 1986 had a, an eruption of uh, thyroid pathology in Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. By comparison, Poland, as soon as it found out about the Chernobyl catastrophe, some days into it because of the cover-up by the Soviets, immediately distributed potassium iodide pills to its population. They do not have a thyroid epidemic in Poland. So given you said that we, you know, there's a long history of, the, of knowing the effects of what happens uh, when these sort of nuclear disasters occur, and you said we have these tests, we knew this was coming, how has our government handled this? knowledge and prepared for it. Deafening silence.